You know, I handle a lot of my invertebrates, but this is an invertebrate I would never want to handle. Hi, Russ of Aquarimax here. I'm here with Ray Tripp of BugEaters.co. Are Horrid King Assassin Bugs the best pet invertebrate? Well, today, after a brief introduction to this species, we'll talk about housing and care, and then go into the pros and cons of the species so you can come to your own conclusion. All right, Ray, so can you introduce this species to us a little bit? Uh, this is the King Horrid Assassin Bug, and it is from Africa. Basically, any place south of the Sub-Sahara and north of South Africa, it occurs in all those different countries, uh, so a whole wide variety of habitats and uh, climate. All right, and uh, about how big does it get? Oh, this guy is uh, is at least two inches long. If you take a look at there on the the ruler there, uh, this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, assassin bug in the world. They're a hemenoptera, so that means half wing. So these guys don't fly, fortunately. Oh, that's good. Because <laughs> something that uh, can do what these guys do, that would be kind of scary. So they're predatory, right? Correct. And uh, let's take a look at it uh, kind of close up and we can see. Uh, Certainly. It's uh, predatory equipment, so to speak. Tell us a little bit about that. So there's the uh, proboscis curled underneath the head. Now the, the inside is curled up inside the head like a clock spring, but it comes out as, uh, as it straightens out its proboscis when it's going to attack uh, a predatory or prey item. So any type of insect or invertebrate, uh, it will attack it, stab it, and drink it dry. But you can also see that it has some protection of its own on the back of the thorax there, those uh, spiky thorns there. Oh yeah, those are pretty incredible. All right, Ray, so you've brought an enclosure of your uh, Horrid King Assassins here. Let's start from the bottom, just kind of tell us how you keep them. So can you tell us about the substrate? Well, literally, the substrate is actually ABG. I like it okay. best. Uh, it, it's a little bit more natural, mm -hmm. as I feel, anyway. It holds some moisture. I don't water them very much at all. I don't want to fly or a mite problem. So I keep it quite dry. So the isopods would have to be a, a dry, loving isopod. Um, I, I still have springtails in here, even though I didn't put them in there. They just happen that way, don't they? Yeah, they do. Springtails find a suitable habitat. And then I might as well make use of uh, the toilet rolls uh, when the toilet paper is used up. Uh, otherwise, it'd just get thrown away. This way, at least, it has more of a, a usability, especially, you know, the egg crate, the flats that I would get uh, with the crickets or, you know, you may end up with the same situation there. So I do use a, a ventilated screen because they can climb glass. And that is good to know, especially with species like this. So there is quite a few in here. And so They're these are run and hide though. These are communal species. You can keep them together with individuals of the same species of various ages, right? Yeah, actually you can raise the babies with them as well. Just as long as you keep them well fed, you'll see some crickets are running around in the cage right now. But they love to hide inside. Can you see that? <laughs> oh, there goes a cricket. <laughs> it's probably not the first one. There we go. But uh, yeah, so I have these, uh, these all over the place looking for a baby for you to see. But I use the tongs for safety purposes. Because these are venomous, they have quite a quite a punch to their bite and they so, can also spray I have never experienced either one of those and that's probably for the best no definitely gosh I was spotting babies earlier maybe they climbed down oh there we go right there and the baby oh I can see it walking around there oh that looks cool the baby one I pinch this tight So there's a nymph. 
So how old would you say this nymph might be approximately? It's a few weeks, so it's had an instar or two because they start off quite small. And I imagine the, uh, the cardboard rolls and the cardboard flats give them a molting surface? Definitely, that's what I, I really like about it. Uh, if I had more cork bark in stock, I would, uh, I would have cork bark in here instead or in addition to what I have now. So are they one of the species that needs to kind of hang to be able to molt properly? Correct. A lot of invertebrates are like that. True. So you said you, you prefer the ABG mix, but are there other uh, types of substrates that you've used as well? Oh, certainly. Back in the 90s, I used to use vermiculite uh, for these guys. And it just like for the tarantulas and stuff, I think everybody used it back then. Uh, however, I found they compacted and it just didn't really work out right. Everybody was dirty. They still bred very well, uh, laying their egg cases on the surface. But where this one, they get to burrow it down and, and put it down inside. And it has just a little bit more protection that way. Same thing if you had like a peat moss or, or a, a organic potting soil, anything like that will work. They come from such a wide variety of, of uh, habitats in Africa. You really can't go wrong with any type of substrate for them. So, as we're checking these guys out a little bit, can you tell me a little bit more about their humidity requirements? Well, they seem to be very simple. So, uh, similar to a lot of tarantulas, they don't have much of a uh, humidity requirement. Uh, they do occur all over the middle part of Africa, so definitely not deserty, which is a bit more of how I keep them right now. Uh, but I think the reason they don't occur all the way down south is because of the winters. But given that vast rainforest, savanna, and, and whatnot, you would think that they would need something more humid. They don't. As long as they can uh, hang and molt. So do you have to make sure that they get water droplets to drink or anything like that or do they get all their moisture requirements from their food? There's a lot of people that actually spray the glass. I haven't found it to be necessary to do that. I used to do that back in the 90s. But I think they're getting all the moisture they need from the insects that I feed them. Of course, the, your animals are what they eat. So the crickets are well fed, well hydrated, and nutritious for them to benefit from it as much as possible. Of course, you don't have to uh, dust the crickets because they're not eating the outside of the cricket itself. Right, that makes sense. So you've mentioned that they like to eat crickets. What else will they eat? Uh, they'll eat virtually anything. They're very opportunistic. So things that you could feed them in the in uh, captivity like the grasshoppers, the roaches, uh, you know, just virtually anything else. I, I bet you they even prey on some of the isopods and, and things like this. Could be a great first food for the babies that they would find right there in the soil. Uh, but in the wild, uh, you know, they, they've got a whole jungle and savanna to, uh, to prey upon. Some of the related species are actually being used in the palm oil plantations to battle the rhino beetles that prey on the uh, the coconuts, which ruins the palm, uh, the oil, the palm oil that they get. So they're an important pest that way. One of the things they found out though was any little bit of pesticide they use on the palm uh, oil trees kills the assassin bugs, and the assassin bugs are so efficient at what they do, they don't want to kill them off because the the pesticides don't kill off the rhino beetles nearly as well as the assassin bugs will. So they prefer the assassins as biological controls? Yeah, absolutely. So what kind of temperature range is ideal for these? Well, in the wild, none of their habitats get under 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Okay. So anything above that, they probably don't breed in those lower temperatures, probably at least a minimum of 70 or 72 degrees Fahrenheit for breeding. And the warmer you have them, the more they eat, the more they breed, the faster they grow. Okay. So probably on the warmer side, but if it dips down into the high 60s once in a while, you're probably okay. Yeah, they should survive just fine. They have in my place. Um, and even when the place, uh, the building has gotten into the high 90s, 
Uh, they they are just doing phenomenal. I don't I don't recommend playing with them at those high temperatures. They're pretty fast. <laughs> I can imagine. All right, so now we have an idea of the care, feeding, housing, all of that. Let's talk about some of the pros or advantages of keeping Horrid King Assassins. Well, they really are unlike anything else in captivity. So that's one of the big exciting things is uh, they're very simple to care for. They have very simple needs. They're very hardy. They're very hard to kill, literally. Um, so they make very ideal pet that in that way. They're not picky about their food, so it's literally anything and everything that you can come across um, to to feed them with. So in that, they're very ideal. They don't fly. They do climb glass, but they don't fly. So the, the screen keeps them well contained. So they're pretty low maintenance and, and simple to care for, it sounds like. Absolutely. They are fascinating uh, subjects to watch grow and change. And uh, I don't know, I, I like watching them eat. And they have some amazing colors too. They do. That's part of the appeal of them. A lot of assassins do have bright colors. There are cryptic ones as well. There's ones that even take their prey and, and stick it to their bodies as camouflage. But I think in captivity, we would prefer to have the bright colored ones. Exactly. So they're also very easy to breed uh, in captivity, which means that we don't have to take them from the wild uh, at all. We have very sustainable populations here. So I did say that they were easy to breed, but they're also extremely durable. So if you take the tweezers and you grab them, uh, you can grab them by the leg and they, many times they've actually picked up the whole egg crate or flat uh, along with it when I picked them up. And that doesn't hurt them at all. It doesn't hurt them at all. They don't really like the whole body to be grasped. If I was to do this, they don't really like that so much. But sometimes that's, that's all you get when you're trying to pick them up. And that is something you have to be really careful with, which kind of leads into the cons of keeping this species. Certainly. As you can smell it right now, not on video perhaps, but uh, they do have a defensive spray. They, oh, yeah. They've been uh, reported to spray from their proboscis. And uh, even one of the gals at the zoo here locally said that she was working down in the tank and uh, was messing with them. And it, it was almost as bad as being maced. Oh, because it did actually spray her in the face. Yeah, the, the, whole, the whole colony will start spraying if you're messing with all of them. And so that can get a little pungent and uh, a little bit... Uh, a, a little bit irritating for your your eyes nose and mouth I personally haven't experienced it I can smell it it's not bothering me but uh, they can definitely definitely have some some behavior uh, that way and there is they do have the capacity to bite yes they can bite it's very uh, painful I understand about like a wasp or a bee sting I've never been bit because I use the tongs, which is a safety uh, procedure there. You definitely want to have tools for that. Uh, these guys, however, I understand, will leave a little hollow like scar uh, when, they, when they do end up biting you. Again, I don't recommend uh, free handling these guys. They're, it's just a little bit dangerous that way, so I take precautions with everything. Why be unsafe? Exactly. So you never want to free handle them. You want to have tongs and other protective gear when you're uh, working with them. Right. You may even uh, decide for yourselves that you want to use a uh, face shield or eye protection just to make sure it, you can't be too safe. Right. Better safe than sorry. All right. So these are definitely not a pet that you would want young children to be able to interact with or uh, you want to keep pets away you want to just 
make sure that these are kept in a protected area. They're not going to come into contact with anyone who might interact with them irresponsibly. Correct. Uh, so if anyone is uh, interacting with these that isn't experienced, you want to supervise them. Uh, just like going out and uh, looking, you know, flipping logs and rocks and stuff like this, you don't know what it is underneath it. Could be a cricket. Could be an assassin bug waiting for a finger. Right, so you definitely don't want to be going around and touching things in there with your bare hands. We're going to show you a technique that Ray uses to handle them in a safe manner. All right, go ahead. All right. This is a dead individual, of course, that we're using for the demonstrative purposes. Right, exactly. So that's the easiest way to demonstrate things. But I also like using the top of a bottle. It's been cut out, holes have been drilled, and then a skewer as well. So I could place that over that, and if I'm not putting paper underneath of it, I could use this skewer to manipulate the insect around encourage it to climb up into it and then once it's up in here I could use it to uh, manipulate it back out into its into its new enclosure for rehousing and you're protected by the, the shield the whole time yeah absolutely so I can control everything keep my fingers away from the holes but I can control it uh, I think that's that's a, an excellent uh, demonstration of a way to uh, handle them safely. I'd like to take a second to thank all of our Patreon backers. We really appreciate your support and you really make a lot of things possible. We couldn't do without you. So thanks again. Well, thanks a lot, Ray, for coming over and showing us your horrid king assassins. Yes. Oh yeah. It's awesome. I really like them a lot, but there's a whole world out there of amazing invertebrates. Yeah, and we're going to have Ray back again in the future with some other creatures that he has that I don't. Thanks for watching today. I post videos every Wednesday and Friday all on aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to share, rate, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then click the bell icon so you don't miss my next video. You got a decent colony there. I got that on film. I got that on film. <laughs> awesome.